My guest today was the head coach at Morristown East High School, as well as head coach at Tusculum College before becoming assistant coach at Carson Newman University in Tennessee for six years. He's now in his 14th year as the head coach at Carson Newman. He also speaks at coaching clinics throughout the U.S., is a three-time speaker at the ABCA convention, and has spoken at all five catcher cons, which are run by our friend Zan Barksdale. Tom Griffin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rob. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be on here. Appreciate all you're doing uh, for not only just baseball, youth baseball, but all baseball. We appreciate it. Well, thank you. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself, Tom, and how you got to where you are now. Well, I'm a native of New Jersey. Grew up in uh, North Jersey, a town called Roxbury, which had a uh, fantastic youth program, uh, especially with baseball, but all sports. It was a great area to, and great time to grow up in. Um, went to school here in uh, uh, Tennessee, Athens, Tennessee, Tennessee Wesleyan. Uh, got done playing here. And fortunately, when I graduated, I got the job as the head coach at Tusculum College, not because um, I was a good coach. I just think I was the only one who could afford to take it. It paid um, $5,000 and I got a room in the dorm and I got to eat in the calf. So there weren't going to be many guys to be able to take it. And I was fortunate enough to start there. Um, after there, went to uh, here to Carson Newman as an assistant was fortunate to get a job at a, a high school situation here locally and then came back as an assistant at Carson Newman and uh, eventually got the head job. And um, this is where my feet have been. So my journey has been uh, through good and bad and learned a lot of lessons throughout the way. That's for sure. What were your playing days like? Well, I'll tell you, uh, like I said, growing up in uh, North Jersey, it, it couldn't be any better, to be honest with you. I think we had a fantastic little league program. Um, you know, our town basically had an American and National League. There were six to seven teams in each league. We used to have a Mayor's Day parade uh, where all the teams showed up at one site and uh, uh, kick off the season. And then you had um, kind of the all-star game and uh, going on to, you know, uh, tournament playoffs type stuff like Little League uh, does. Um, summer ball when we were in high school was, uh, American Legion. It was Babe Ruth. There was big league. There were three different organizations that you could play. And some guys played in two of them. So, um, I was surrounded by a lot of good organizational baseball and a lot of good coaches who volunteered their time and, um, you know, helped you to love the game and, uh, helped you to improve it along the way. So that when you saw those improvements and you were playing better, you wanted to stay in it. And um, couldn't have been a better time growing up. And I uh, uh, had a good high school program. And I was fortunate enough that Tennessee Wesleyan to have uh, two great coaches and some assistants who continued the development. And I knew back in high school that I wanted to coach and I wanted to teach. Um, there was no question that's what I wanted to do the rest of my life. So how did you – I didn't catch if you had played in college. Did you play through college? Yeah, I played at Tennessee Wesleyan. It's an NAI school in Athens, Tennessee. I was fortunate enough to play there for four years. And um, be quite honest with you, I started catching the first day my dad took me to a little league sign up. Really? And, um, you know, the guy said, who wants to catch? It was BP time. Who wants to catch? Well, no one wanted to do it. I raised my hand, uh, the first one to raise his hand. So he says, go grab that army duffel bag and dump it out. and You'll find the gear at the bottom. And so um, put the gear on. Someone basically showed me what to do with everything. And from that point on, I never played another position. I caught my whole life um, through high school, through college, even in local men's league here in Jersey and in Tennessee up till I was 49 years of age. Um, the only time I didn't catch was um, my senior year at Tennessee Wesleyan in the fall. I think I played third base twice and I DH'd one time. But besides that, I've caught my whole life. Um, and, uh, I feel that's helped me a lot as a, as a coach, because, um, as we know, we're, we're behind the scenes. We see a lot of things. We spend a lot of time with coaches, learning the game, learning the other positions. So, uh, it was invaluable to be able to catch, um, really my whole life. That's fascinating. And we know that there are a lot of hall of fame coaches in MLB who started off as catchers and who were catchers. So that's, that makes sense that catchers become good coaches. So I'm just curious because you mentioned that you had been catching for basically your whole playing career. How are your knees? Well, uh, 
as I'm getting older, it's getting tougher to um, squat down. It's not the squatting down. It's the getting up part right now that gets a little more difficult. Um, and the recovery time takes longer. But um, I've had to have maybe um, two meniscus surgeries in the last five years. Um, you know, I'm 55. So really starting at 50 is when they, they, they started to have some issues. But really, um, I've not had problems. And I think part of that is the fact that my body, like most catchers who catch a lot, your body becomes acclimated to the workload and, um, you know, develops resiliency and, and be able to handle what you're doing. And obviously, we've got to be smart about what we do with our training. And we've learned a lot here and um, now compared to, say, 20, 30 years ago. But I do think catching all the time help my body be able to handle that workload and stay relatively uh, injury free. So someone had asked me before about whether or not uh, catching reduces athleticism in a kid. So I actually would like to ask you that question. So would you mind answering that from your perspective, Tom? Yeah, from my perspective, I, I think it actually promotes uh, more athleticism um, yeah, we do a lot of things from lower to the ground, uh, obviously with our stances, but what we have to do from the throwing aspects, the receiving aspects, the blocking aspects, fielding bunts, wild pitches, whether it's pop-ups, we've got a lot of other things that involve athleticism. And if you look at what major league baseball and even some of the guys in the big leagues right now, you see a lot of former third basemen, shortstops, uh, positional guys who they're converting into catchers because it takes such athleticism to play that position. Now, you know, the days of taking the biggest, heaviest kid who can't move and sticking them behind the dish, which is probably why I ended up there because I was that guy. Um, that's kind of changed. And now we're seeing that you better have your best athlete or one of your better athletes better be behind that dish because we know how important this position is mm -hmm. next to probably the guy on the mound. The catcher is the most important spot because if you, if you're not a very good shortstop or you don't have a very good second baseman or maybe deficient in one of the outfield positions that can be hidden in the course of a game because no balls are hit to him. Mm -hmm. But that catcher, you're going to know if that catcher isn't very adept or very talented because you're going to see it right away. Every time a ball is thrown of whether this guy's got a chance or not. So you're going to be exposed a lot quicker behind the dish than you will maybe in some other positions. And that's why I feel that you probably need your better athlete back there. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tom. We appreciate that. So today, Tom, you're going to help us coach up our young catchers. But before we do that, I'd like our audience to get to know Tom Griffin a little better with some lightning style about me questions, followed by some word association questions. You ready? Yes, sir. Favorite team? I'm a Kansas City Royal fan. Favorite player? Right now, because of a Royal, Salvador Perez. Love watching him catch. Favorite movie? I'm a Notre Dame football fan, so it's Rudy. Morning person or night person? Uh, morning. Favorite book? Um, Lou Holtz. Um, wins, losses, and lessons. Uh, love anything Lou Holtz has written. And then um, Culture, Co uh, Culture Code by uh, Daniel Coyle is a phenomenal book for all coaches. Favorite quote? Um, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. Favorite drill? I like combination drills. I like um, where you take a, a receiving and blocking drill and combine them together. Uh, more of a complex drill versus a simple drill. I like to get into that as much as possible. Last book you read? Uh, the Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Favorite coaching tool or resource? Well, we're fortunate right now, Rob, just like this. These podcasts um, are fantastic. There's certain guys on Twitter I like to follow. I like to call coaches and just talk and ask questions. I do that all the time. Um, I think CatcherCon and what Zan has done is, is really changed the position unlike we've ever seen before. I think that is one of the best tools for catchers I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Something you used to believe that you now know is wrong. Um, you know, I, I really don't. I, that's a tough question. I, I really don't know if, if what I did in the past, I can look back now and say, I wish I had done it differently. But at the time, it was right. And it's what we believed in. So I would hard, I'd be hard pressed to say, well, that wasn't right. 
um, because I think a lot of things I've did in the past that might be different now, but the basis of them are based on what I learned from other coaches and what I learned through my experiences. So I, I would say there's not very much. I think there was a plan for all of it. Something you believe others think is crazy. I guess now today, I guess it's not that crazy because not everybody, we don't call pitches. I, I believe in the catchers calling the game and getting the coaches out of the pitch calling business. Um, there's still a lot that let their catchers call it. So I don't know if that's any different, but um, I'd like to see the catchers call their games more. All right. And now word association. First thing that comes to mind with the following words or phrases, catching. Athletic. Primary stance. Evolved. Mental game. Crucial. Travel ball. Uh, has a purpose. Blocking. Toughness. Secondary stance. Evolving. Pop time. Not that important. Receiving. Crucial. Big. Rec league baseball. Wish we hadn't lost it. Um, miss it. And knee savers. <laughs> uh, if you have them, keep them. Uh, if you don't have them, don't need to buy them. There's other things to invest in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, Tom, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to follow up on a couple of those things. Uh, yeah. One thing you mentioned was for primary and secondary stance, you said evolving. So in what ways are those stances evolving? Well, you know, when we grew up, uh, you know, the one knee has become popular. I think um, what we've seen in Major League Baseball, the one knee stance, um, you know, there was a time I think coaches were like, well, that's a lazy stance. You need to be in the, the traditional primary, secondary stance and the one knee has got kind of a laziness and there's a lot of mistakes that can happen from it. But really, one knee has happened throughout baseball. Elrod Hendricks, Jerry Grody. I was a Met fan at one time when I was a little kid. Jerry Grody for the New York Mets was a one knee guy. Benito Santiago, Tony Pena used to sit on his rear end. I remember in the 80s, a lot of us used to really sit on our rear ends. And the whole purpose was to give the umpire as good a look as we could and open up as many windows as we could for the umpire. So I think guys did the stance. It wasn't popular like it is now. But I think we're seeing now through statistics that Major League Baseball provides for us that for some guys, it's a huge advantage to be in that stance. And what we get from the statistical analysis, that it is better. Um, so I think that's how it's evolved and basically from the Major Leagues down. So I understand that from a primary stance, and I remember, I believe it was Tony Pena, he would also like have one leg like flat out. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But from the secondary stance, is, are catchers on one knee? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's been the big thing um, that we've seen, depending on your pitcher, is it can be more effective for guys, not only for the receiving part, obviously, because it puts them in a position to receive certain pitches, and give the umpire a better look, or if we can deceive the umpire, um, we have a better chance sometimes on the one knee. But also blocking. I see a lot of young kids, even some of our guys, who are actually be more effective in blocking um, than they will in the traditional secondary stance. And some of them will actually be better throwers because the way the leg is into the ground and how short we are with our footwork, that some guys are actually more athletic on one knee. If you take um, a certain kid who um, maybe catches it really well, but he's, he has trouble staying in his stance. You can see him wobbling. The legs are tired. He's constantly standing up trying to stretch his legs. Let's relieve that pressure because he, he has some tightness in areas that maybe we can't address right now. It's going to take some time. Put him on one knee where he's able to receive in more comfort. Teach the block on the one knee. Now, is he going to be able to block balls outside his body two three feet well no but 
we're probably not going to do that in the secondary stance anyway. We, we have a certain area that we've got to make sure we kind of block, but there's certain areas, it doesn't matter what stance we're going to be in. And our, our primary concern is always going to be catch first, block second, catch third, then throw. I mean, you got to put throwing on that back end because we can control that more with the pitchers and what they do. Um, but the catching and the blocking part, that can be done on one, Nate, and be effective for a lot of guys. So if they're in their secondary stance, runners on base, if they're on one knee, usually at least for the younger kids, I'm not sure about maybe college and up, but for younger kids, if they're on one knee, it's harder for them to get up to reach a ball that might be way outside, way inside, uh, high, which is where a lot of these youth pitchers can end up throwing. So for youth kids, would one knee, in your opinion, still work well? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I see it, um, you know, listen, I'm a, like all of us, we love the game of baseball and what youth coaches are doing the very start and their first three years is going to make or break kids, uh, and loving the game. And so, that this is the groundwork what uh, your uh, audience is all about. And, and I've seen those games. I love to go watch that. I love to do it in our camps with the young kids. We definitely see kids that are very effective, more effective on the one knee than they are in that traditional stance where they're struggling to just stay in that stance and the discomfort that you can see in their body language. It's like, let's relieve that. And a lot of times, even in our camps, I'll have guys go to two knees when we're doing receiving drills just to kind of take their legs out of it so they can focus on catching the ball. And so we put them on two knees and just have them on receiving balls. That's that's the drill. That's that's what we want to focus on. Where the legs are getting tired, their brain is like, whoa, I can't hold this any longer. We want to kind of take that out of play. So I think for some kids, definitely, Rob. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So then are there specific fundamental fundamental like – uh, techniques or a way of doing it for doing this one knee stance? Well, let me show you. I, I got a, I got some room here, Rob, and hopefully you can see this. So here we are in our traditional stance that we'll see. So all we're asking a young man to do is just put this leg down. We still like to keep our chin out over our toes and not sit back. So we're, we're, we've got our rear end up a little bit. It allows me to have my clearance with my hands. It allows me to raise up even from this stance. And so basically we can receive in this position here. And for youth, I like using two hands um, just to have a little more balance. Uh, the younger kids, it's hard to catch things with one hand. So we try to create a little more balance and strength with our core. But if we're making our catch here and in our blocking, literally all we have to do is just drop the glove. Now guys are going to say, well, you got a lot of holes under there. Well, certainly we do, but we can also from here is to drop the leg down as well to make the block and teach our young guys to do that. But a lot of guys will make blocks right in this position here. And for our throwing portion, we're just taking this foot and jab stepping towards the direction that we're going. And what knee they put down, Rob, um, they'll find out what's comfortable for them. Um, that's why it's a trial and error. 